Aloha, this is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing Kelly Thompson. She is the current writer for the 2021 Eisner award-winning series, Black Widow. She is also the current writer for Captain Marvel and is one of the writers of, and the and their writing group is called, now correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, the um, Beyond Board. <laughs> yeah. And it's for, the, they are writing The Amazing Spider-Man. Also too, Kelly is also going to be, I'm going to also have, also Kelly's going to be talking about her, her um, Substack um, series, Black Cloak and The Cull. Um, and it's available now on our Substack. But more importantly, she is the writer for It's Jeff, one of the you know, Infinity Comics on Marvel Unlimited. Kelly, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. No, Kelly, thank you very much. Now, before we start, you know, may I ask, can you tell the listeners about It's Jeff? <laughs> I can, I can. Uh, so It's Jeff is a web only for now strip that's mm -hmm. on Marvel Unlimited. They did like a brand new revamp of their app. So it's basically got, you know, tons and tons of old comics plus and, and by old comics, I just mean, I think six months and later is like where they start. Um, so, you know, it's great for sort of catch-up reading, but then they've also got a bunch of new web-only comics that they're promoting, and It's Jeff was one of the first ones out of the gate there, and um, I'm a little biased, but I have to say it's obviously the best one. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Guri, Guri Hiru are our incredible artists, colorists. Uh, they are just really big fans of Jeff, and they bring so much passion and fun to it. Uh, they're basically almost entirely silent strips. Like, sometimes they'll have exclamation points or icons in word balloons but the only real word that's said other than the occasional sound effect or those kind of icon balloons is jeff's name jeff jeffrey um, something of that sort he does get yelled at a lot but uh, they're very they're very quick reads they're sort of intended to be heartwarming funny some of them have a little bit of a lesson they're sort of like well-told jokes or like little mini cartoons yes. mm -hmm. and uh they're really fun people are loving them it's literally what i get talked to about the most these days mm -hmm. um they're they're coming out weekly on fridays um there's 11 of them out so far i think the last one of this quote-unquote season comes out this week and it's a thanksgiving themed one it's it's very cute mm -hmm. uh, i think people will enjoy it and also, to um, for listeners who are not familiar with Jeff, Jeff is now Kelly. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's kind of sort of a land shark. Oh yeah, sorry, dog, I, right? left because... <laughs> I, left right? that, I left that out. I left that. I left that out. Yeah, he's an adorable um, land shark. Um, some call him a baby land shark, but he's sort of just a fully grown, adorable little little round boy. Uh, he's. Uh, He's very cute. He was he, the, the, the origin story for Jeff. I, I came up with him. Uh, Daniele Di Nicolo did the original drawing for him. It was from my West Coast Avengers run. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, basically, Modoc had put himself into a handsome body that he was calling Brodoc. And while he was Brodoc, he invented or uh, biogenetically engineered these land sharks to attack mm -hmm. Venice Beach. And uh, Jeff was not one of those. He's sort of like the misfit runt of the litter who uh, Gwen Poole adopted him after, uh, after a crazy fight against Modoc in his regular form. And she then handed him off to Deadpool for a while because mm -hmm. she was, you know, Deadpool and Gwen Poole are characters that break the fourth wall and they're like aware they're in a comic book. And so mm -hmm. she placed Jeff with Deadpool because Deadpool's always pretty much got a book. And so she knew his story would be able to continue on. And uh, I, I, that book got canceled, <laughs> uh, but fortunately Jeff lives on in It's Jeff. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's a really fun character. Every day on my social media, people are demanding Jeff merch, especially plushes they want. A lot mm -hmm. of people want a Funko. I want a lunchbox. We, mm -hmm. we want it all. Where, where is it? <laughs> now off the cuff, you know, I don't have this down, but correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they make Jeff um, part of the Marvel Legends line? 
Yeah, he okay. showed up in the, because he was in the Deadpool book, I think, and people are sort of excited about him. And I think the, the toy people like were catching on. Uh -huh. uh, they put him as a, like a side character. Uh, yes. You can get him with the Shikla figure who was <laughs> Deadpool's wife or ex-wife, depending on what you're reading. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so there is a figure of him. It's like mm -hmm. a small side figure. I hope one day he'll graduate to his own full figure. There's also a, um, there's a really cool uh, Gwenpool. And I'm sorry, I don't know the, I don't know the distributor's name. Mm -hmm. I think it's a Japanese company. Oh. They're doing a super cool sort of anime Gwenpool that's adorable. And she has a, a Jeff in there with her again as sort of like a side figure and that jeff is is much more stylized like the guri hero jeff where like nice. a little round guy mm -hmm. so he's very cute so so we'll have that coming but you know i'd like him to I, so far most of what i have for jeff are fan mm -hmm. art stuff that people mm -hmm. have either sent me or that i've bought from them oh, like nice. needlepoint and a crochet jeff and patches this one woman's <laughs> making these incredible patches uh, people just love it they're really freaking out for them it's it's been super fun mm -hmm. that's pretty cool that is thank you very much for sharing that of course now before we start the interview i just want to go over your your history so correct me if i'm wrong at any point so um you started off as a staff writer at comic book resources um between 2009 2015. um you wrote two prose novels um, the Girl Who Would Be King in 2012, Story Killer in 2014, and then, now correct me if I'm wrong, this is your, was this your first comic that you wrote, comic book series you wrote, Gem in the Holograms for, for, um, from IDW? It is. It's not the first comic strip I oh, wrote, sorry. but it was the first one that published. So, oh. because I had already, um, my, my <laughs> Substack collaborator, Meredith McLaren, and I, she and I were working on a graphic novel that had been picked up from Dark Horse, but oh. you know, it was like 160 pages or whatever. So we'd been working on it for like a year when I got the gem job. But so okay. gem actually started coming out before Heart in a Box. So it did end up being sort of my first thing. Although I, I did do a charity um, story in the uh, womanthology book. Um, it's just a four page short that I wasn't <laughs> paid for, but I got to work with Stephanie Hans who, did the covers to most of my books and I'm a very big fan of hers. We're friends. So that was fun to sort of do something like that. So that was probably technically the first thing I published in comics was mm -hmm. that um, charity thing. Uh -huh. But yeah, Gem was the second thing to hit publishing. So for sure. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that I'd call myself a staff writer, but I did freelance write. And those, oh, those, okay. those dates are about right. So yeah. Okay. And then I'm just going to name other other um, works that you've done. You did, I believe, a short story in it's called Verto from Creepy in issue number 20 from Dark Horse, 2015. Mm -hmm. Nancy Drew um, from Dynamite in 2018. And mm -hmm. then, of course, your Marvel work. I'm just only going to name a few. Um, like you mentioned, the West Coast Avengers from 2018 to 2019. Hawkeye from 2016 to 2018, Jessica Jones from 2018 to 2019. Now, I'm going to ask, did I miss any of your works um, that you're very proud of? And you can just give them a shout out. Or um, I'm proud of all of them in a weird mm -hmm. way. I mean, I think A-Force was my first big thing I did for Marvel, mm -hmm. sort of on my own. Has a lot of female characters I really love, and mm -hmm. particularly issues... Um, five through eight are mm -hmm. with Ben Caldwell, who it was a long dream to work with Ben. So mm -hmm. I particularly love that. And Ian Herring did our colors there. So I particularly love those three issues a lot. We created a Dazzler Thor, you know, we were having a really good time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so I love it. I also am very fond of my Deadpool stuff. You know, we only got 10 issues, but you know, I think we made a lot of them. We did mm -hmm. a lot of fun stuff with it. But yeah, I think Jessica Jones, West Coast Avengers, Hawkeye, those are some of my favorites other than the stuff I'm working on now. I will say, um, in addition to the Nancy Drew that I did for Dynamite, I did two volumes of Sabrina the Teenage Witch for mm -hmm. Archie Comics. Yes. And I did those with um, Veronica and Andy Fish. And I just think they're really lovely and fun. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're a little bit dark because they're dealing with sort of witch stuff, mm -hmm. but yes. they, they keep it sort of light. And, you know, you get Salem the Talking Cat, like what's not to like, right? It's a good mm -hmm. time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to continue on. Um, 
where can listeners follow you on social media? Um, the best bet really is Twitter, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to say, which is no. at 79 semifinalists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Substack is really, I know it doesn't feel like social media, but that's the best way to keep track of me these days. It's, I'm posting every week to that. It's mm -hmm. got a ton of fun, cool information in it. Um, so that's 1979semifinalist.substack.com. Okay. And then, um, I'm, forgive me because I didn't, I, I didn't get a chance to research this part yet, but um, where did the 1979 semifinalists come from? Exactly. It's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, Spike, by the time I got to social media, there's a million Kelly Thompson's in the world. So oh. I knew I needed to sort of brand myself a little bit. Um, and 1979 semifinalist is a, a very favorite song from one of my favorite bands called the bad plus. Oh. Um, and then I, I also sort of think of it a little bit, this is a little silly, but it's sort of a state of being, right? The idea of being a constant semifinalist. Um, mm -hmm. Not because it means you're not winning, but because it means you're keeping trying. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. you're not there yet. Keep going. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a little bit of a, that's sort of the energy of what I'm doing. Keep, keep going. We can oh, do it. That's Let's go. Cool. That's pretty cool. That that's a great thanks. Leader. Yeah, that that's thanks. That's pretty cool. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> of course, I'll tell you. I get asked that question a lot, and uh, I think you asking that today is the first time I've gotten the answer down the way I'd like it to be. So, <laughs> just try to memorize what I said to you for the future. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, now, where did you grow up? I grew up in a lot of places. Um, my dad worked. Um, did not for a military company, but they ended up um, bidding a lot of military government jobs. And so there was a little bit the feeling of being a military brat where, you know, mm -hmm. every six to 10 years, you sort of pick up stakes and move to a new location. So mm -hmm. I was born in California. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still sort of what I consider home. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I lived for, gosh, six or seven years in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And then I lived for my formative high school years in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I left as soon as humanly possible. It's very lovely, but it's not for me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> listen, it's a very beautiful place. The people are incredibly nice. Uh, I don't really like being landlocked to start and then okay. to finish. It's incredibly conservative and religious. So that's not really my, my vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, went away to school. I went to Arizona. I went to U of A for a while. I went to SCAD in Savannah. So I sort of bounced around a lot. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, what what was or were your first comic that you read? So <laughs> th this is a little bit muddy because the first comics I read were really Archie comics, like Digest yeah. that you would get at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So I really credit Archie comics with really creating my love for comics and also mm -hmm. teaching me how to read them very early, which when you're talking to people who don't understand comics, I find that's a big, um, that's a big block for them. Most of the people who don't really get comics or don't seem to understand them or be into them didn't read them when they were young for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So they just don't have that sort of innate love of them that you have, I think, when you read them early and, and you sort of fall in love with the medium itself, you know? So I have to give Archie a lot of credit, but until I found comics again in a sort of different way as a teenager, I didn't understand there was like a whole world of comics, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't understand they came out every week and you could go to a shop and, and get a pull where they held them for you. And, you know, I didn't understand there was this whole community, which, you know, is even more different now with the internet and yes. social mm -hmm. media. But even then, like it was just a whole other world. So I discovered those in a sort of roundabout way because my brother and I had a few weeks or months before this happened, discovered the X-Men, the animated series Oh yeah, mm -hmm. on Saturday morning. We fell in love with it. We thought it was the greatest thing we'd ever seen. Uh -huh. And then a couple weeks or maybe a couple months later, he came home from the mall, sort of jumping up and down. And he had Uncanny X-Men number 290 with oh Storm on the cover. Yeah. And he was like, look, it's the girl from that cartoon. And I was like, oh, my God. And it sort of blew our minds. 
<clears throat> and so that became my first new comic. I hadn't read Digest in, you know, at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that just opened up a whole world. It was just then a, a whole incredible journey of me learning all about the ins and outs of comics and mm -hmm. just really fell in love with it again. Uh, so yeah, uh, Uncanny X-Men 290 was a very like formative moment for me. Um, mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. Continue. Sorry. No, no, no. That's it. That's uh, it. Definitely broke everything open. Um, I was X Men, of course, was sort of my my first love and my real where my heart sort of beat. But you know, it didn't take long when mm -hmm. you love comics to see all that's out there and begin branching out into all sorts of things. So, off the cuff question: Did you ever meet Chris Claremont and like kind of like thank him or anything like that? I did meet Chris Claremont. He was really rude. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, especially as a creator now, you can't fault someone. You know, they're going through their day. They're having a whole other day that has yeah. nothing to do with you. I yeah. don't hold it against him. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, the, the only con I've ever gone to, I went to when I was a kid. Yeah. And uh, well, before I got in, long before I really got into comics as something for my career. Mm -hmm. And Jim Lee and Claremont were both at, it was the San Diego Comic Con. Ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, but a much different thing than it is today. I mean, yeah. so much smaller, so much smaller and more manageable, but I thought it was incredible. And, uh, yeah, we, my brother and I took a bunch of our X-Men comics to have them sign. And mm -hmm. I think his sovereign, <sighs> sovereign seven. No, was that what it was called? He had some new creator owned thing that had just had come out not so long ago. And so my brother and I very dutifully had that in there to be signed as well. Um, you know, like to be respectful about it, even though we couldn't have given a crap about that. I mean, oh, we, yeah, just cared, yeah. we, just, we just cared about X-Men, you know, yeah. uh, we were just kids, but, um, yeah, he was, he was not so happy about signing the X-Men and he was pretty rude about it, but, uh, oh. it was still a hilarious, yes. amazing experience. <laughs> And one that I have a lot more context for today as a creator, you know, mm -hmm. who you would not believe the things people say to me on a daily basis. I, yeah, Shocking. Yeah. I, I mean, it's also amazing. I, yeah. you know, I can go online at any time and people are just being nice to me and saying incredible things mm -hmm. that are so wonderful to have someone say to you. But, you know, there's always the other side of that coin as well. So yes. I have a lot more, <laughs> I have a lot of more respect for why he might have been rude to us on that day you know yeah uh, i'm sure it had nothing to do with us yes oh, i'm sorry about that that's all right i'm going to move on to another question <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay so drew wants to know drew the calls for comics for fun and profit he submitted this question what was your first lcs actually for you and your brother yeah so our first, it wasn't the first shop we went to, but when we figured out enough about comics to understand that we needed to get a pull, and that was a thing, yes. uh, our pull was at Night Flight Comics in Salt Lake City, oh. which is a little bit famous, actually. It's in a Frank Miller comic. I can't remember. One of the Sin City ones, I think. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like drawn into that. She knew Frank Miller. It was run by a woman, which... Uh -huh. Uh, Mimi, it's... Mimi was her name, and I 100% credit having a really good inclusive shop. As you know, I didn't have that that bar that a lot of women, and right. I I don't know I don't I don't hear a lot of stories of it happening to people of color and other minorities, but I hear mostly about it happening to women. But that might just be because I am a woman. I'm not sure. But you know, a lot of women have a really bad experience at comic shops and it really turns them away at, mm -hmm. at important formative times for them yes. when they're trying to become a fan. And I got very lucky where mm -hmm. everyone at that shop was very cool. They were very into mm -hmm. my brother and I discovering comics. They were great. They were mm -hmm. great. I won tickets or they gave me tickets to the crow one time, oh, uh, nice. you know, just randomly. Like they were a great shop. They were mm -hmm. a great shop. Oh my God. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, were you in high school at this time when you went to see the crow? I'm sorry, I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I was in I was in high school when I saw the crow. Yeah. Okay, were were your parents kind of go, yeah, go see that movie? Wait, what rating is they that? Were, <laughs> they were pretty good about it. I mean, I think like a lot of American parents, they're less worried about violence than sex. Weirdly, yes. um, I think they were pretty good with me. I was a very responsible together teenager. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. I wanted to take my younger brother to it. And I can't remember if they let us do that or not. 
Mm -hmm. I think I think maybe they didn't let me do that. I can't remember though, because I do remember when when Mimi gave me the ticket, she was like, "I think probably your brother's too young for it," and I was like, "Oh, okay." okay. So, but it was fun. (laughs) I'm sorry. Before I continue on an off the cuff question, so the other your the um like the the brother that came home with the uh, X Men two ninety comic was he Mm -hmm. an older brother or the younger brother? Younger younger both my brothers are younger okay. uh dave also came back that was scott he was he's my middle brother mm-hmm. and he's uh what three years younger than me two or three years younger than me and then my brother dave is three uh like four or five years younger than me like depending on when it hits um dave brought home x-force number three but he never really got into comics okay he, ch- he tried it a little bit here and there he would sometimes read stuff i thought i maybe hooked him a couple years ago because he really liked saga i sent him saga and he really liked it and he did really like it but he never quite he never quite made the leap into other books mm-hmm. i've tried i've tried but it's just not for him okay so okay so um so um so i'm gonna so i'm gonna ask so is it is it scott is he excited that you're a comic book writer very he's very wow. supportive he's really he really loves it um he's i think sometimes he sort of can't believe it because mm-hmm. who could right it's weird <laughs> okay this is going to be one of those off the cuff questions that i don't have written down but the scott you know if scott comes over for dinner and sometime and he talks to you and he turns to you go hey um can you get Jim Starr to sign this book? You know, does he do, does he do that? I'm, I'm joking. I'm kind of joking, but but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's not. I mean, he's still into comics, but he doesn't read them as sort of not the way I do. I mean, he's not that involved with the industry like that. Also, he unfortunately still, still lives in Salt Lake, so I rarely get to have dinner with him. But oh. yeah, we talk about shops sometimes. We've sometimes, you know, shared that kind of stuff. But you know, I think. I think he has the problem that a lot of people who love comics have Mm -hmm. is that when you get older and you don't have that much free time to yourself because you have kids, job, wife, whatever you've got going on, uh, you know, comics takes a lot of energy to Mm -hmm. stay involved in, you know, it's not like a TV show that just beams into your house every week. You know, there's a lot of different stuff. There are a lot of different options. And I think real fans like want to stay engaged in all of that stuff and want to stay current, but it can be very overwhelming very quickly. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Especially if you've got a lot on your plate. I mean, you know, I remember as a teenager, I rushed through those books that I got every week, mm-hmm. you know, like they, not a single sentence went unread because yeah. I had tons of time. Yeah. (laughs) What was I going to do, right? Just read some comics, man. I'm living the life. But, uh, you know, when I was in, I stopped reading for a while when I was in college, but like when I was living in New York, you know, I was buying all these books every week, but I was so busy with work and I was trying Mm -hmm. to write on the side and I was doing all this stuff that I was just, the stack was just getting insane of unreads and it becomes really overwhelming and it starts to feel like a chore instead of this thing that you're so into. And uh, I, I think there's a, there's a real funny irony there because the fans, you know, they really stick with it. They really have such a love for this medium, but it's ironic that we really mostly write entirely to them. Mm-hmm. Yet it was when I was a kid, you mm-hmm. know, and a teenager and all of that, that I had the infinite time that, yes. that comics, mm-hmm. you know, sort of sometimes needs. So yeah. it's a little, a little ironic. So I'm going to, so I know listeners, this is only an audio podcast. Kelly can see behind me my boxes and boxes of comics <laughs> that I still haven't read. And oh, no. Kelly, I'm going to joke with you, okay? I'm just going <laughs> to joke with you. We're, we're still in Court of Owls, right? Right. The <laughs> 52 is still, we just started, right? <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I feel you. It's a particularly hard with books that have double shipping, like Batman, man it's it's a brutal schedule also i don't know i don't know how the writers do it man Mm -hmm. it's uh it's very overwhelming to to do a weekly book i mean i lucked out because i'm part of a team so i don't have to worry about it like that but Mm -hmm. it's a lot man and we're going to touch a little bit on that when we start talking about spider-man in a minute um and um okay so um so how did your journey um to working comics begin so I went to 
so I always wanted to be a writer ever since I was little. Like some of my earliest memories are of writing stories in books and like mm-hmm. not just writing stories, but making little construction paper books out of them. Like I remember when I was really little, like six, I did a series about some mermaid sisters. And then for each book, it was focused on a different mermaid. And so I would make the construction paper cover Mm -hmm. and then I would cut out a circle on the front and then draw the mermaid on the first page. So like I was doing die cut Uh before I even knew what die cut was. (laughs) So it wasn't just that I wanted to write. It was that I wanted to create things, Uh I think. And I wanted to share them and people to like them and be interested in them, which is not wholly separate from just wanting to write. But I think it is an interesting distinction. Um, so I was always interested in that and I always liked drawing, but I think I knew deep inside that was going to be a hard road for me. Like, and maybe I didn't have the discipline for that. Whereas the writing came more naturally and I seemed to be better at. Yes. Um, but when I discovered comics, so I wanted to be a writer all that time, but when I discovered comics again, as an older person, I suddenly realized, oh, this is it. This is the writing and the art that I've been looking for. How could I have missed this? Mm -hmm. And so I went immediately from those comics being brought home to making my own comics. So like creating my own characters and writing my own. So like there was no, there was no, over there was no (laughs) there was no gap between those things starting it was like I read the comic and then I started sketching and and creating my own stuff like it just immediately Mm -hmm. um so it never really went away for me like many things though as you grow and change there was an ebb and flow to it um I went to the University of Arizona Arizona and I technically was an art major but you know in the early days at a four-year college you're mostly taking basic poli sci and things like that so it wasn't until my second year where I started taking some art classes um and or some serious ones and I had this I was considering transferring to maybe Savannah College of Art and Design to study comics but I I was very nervous about it and I wasn't sure what the right decision was and I had it was one of those key moments in your life that a lot of people don't get these but if you get them I feel like you're very lucky and you should hold on to it and like really make changes in your life based on a thing that's happened. Right. So Mm -hmm. what happened to me was I went to class, this graphic design class that I really liked Mm -hmm. and they, we were doing a new project and for extra credit you could design. So you were designing like a bottle and the, like for a drink. And I think, I think a lot of people were doing alcohol. So it was probably alcoholic something. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to do the extra credit, you could build like the carrying case, like whatever the six pack is or whatever, you could build that to go with your bottle. And I really liked the project and I was excited about my idea. I thought it was cool. And so I was like, I'm going to do the extra credit. So Mm -hmm. I do the extra credit. I stay up late into the night and I go in for crit day and every single person has done the extra credit. Oh, Mm-hmm. And I realized it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, I'm never going to be the best at this mm-hmm. because when these people go home at night, they're yeah. still thinking about graphic design and mm-hmm. I'm thinking about comics. Mm-hmm. So I'm never going to be the best graphic designer because it's not really what I want. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so I don't know if I'm going to be the best at anything in comics, mm-hmm. but I can at least try it. Like yes. it's, this is the world telling me a thing. Mm-hmm. And so I made my decision right there that I was going to transfer uh, I needed some money, so I took a year off to work mm-hmm. um, to save some money, and yeah, then I transferred to SCAD, where mm-hmm. I got a degree in sequential art. When I left SCAD, I think I went to LA for a few years and just worked just to, you know, I was mm-hmm. always writing on the side, but it wasn't really working out. I moved to New York at a certain point um, and sort of continued that thing, working jobs, work, doing mm-hmm. my writing on the side. Um, around the 2007, 2009 area that you noted at CBR, I started mm-hmm. blogging, mm-hmm. which led me to Brian Cronin, who ran Comics Should Be Good. Mm-hmm. I started writing an op-ed for him. I did all that stuff. So it was never that far from my mind. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, I was just all that time I was writing. I was writing novels. I was writing Mm -hmm. pitches for comics. I wrote Heart in a Box, which became my first graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And like all those little things just sort of finally added up to 
you know, Marvel saying, hey, come co-write this thing and mm-hmm. hey, pitch this other thing. And, you know, it just sort of broke open. Wow. So, in, and I'm just, I'm just making observations. And this, this is where it's kind of like the idea, it's like, keep trying, keep moving yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. Keep, actually not keep trying, but I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rephrasing, but it's keep doing this. Yeah, yeah, it's keep pushing, it's keep yeah. pushing. I mean, I, I think when I talk to people about my career, a lot of them are really shocked how far I've come. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I was talking to someone on a different podcast about <laughs> how long it had taken us to get a Black Widow movie that mm-hmm. when we were all talking about it and bitching about it as a community, where was our Black Widow movie? Yeah. I hadn't even started publishing comics yet. Oh. And now I've published hundreds. I've won an Eisner. Like that's how long. So like that's yeah. how fast it happened or that's how long we waited for a Black Widow movie, depending on how you choose to look at it. <laughs> yes. uh, but um, so it happened for me really fast once mm-hmm. it started happening. Like I know a lot of people look at my career and they're like, wow, you just went so fast. But like, you know, don't ignore the 10 years before that yeah. of mm-hmm. working you know, working all day and then coming home and writing at night and pre- preparing pitches and writing columns and reviews and doing a podcast to connect with people and build my audience so that I could kickstart a book so that I could, you know, like it all, most people's careers look like that. I mean, I, uh, you got to keep going. I mean, like, it's a really, <laughs> it's a really trite concept, but it's painfully true, which is the only way to fail is to give up before you succeed. I mean, that's, that's a failure. If you're still trying, then you haven't failed yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I sound like I need to do a really bad Ted talk right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to, I want to make this, I'm going to try and make this a little bit more upbeat. How <laughs> excited were you to see your name either on your first graphic novel or on the novel, The Girl Who Would Be King? I think on my first graphic novel or on Gem, like, you know, one of the things with Gem coming out first, and that was my first big thing. So I'd done the, you know, I had a graphic novel picked up, but it wasn't out yet. Mm -hmm. And then I had this little charity short and I'd done nothing else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so Jem even got a previews cover mm-hmm. and everything so it was like such a huge way to splash into the industry mm-hmm. it was very exciting it was very I mean I it was it was literal dreams coming true and you're like god I hope this is going to work out and not just be this one story that I have I mm-hmm. hope it's going to launch a career and mm-hmm. you know it was uh it was interesting the girl who became was a little different because you know, I was self-publishing that. I was doing Mm -hmm. it at a time when Kickstarter was pretty new. Mm -hmm. Um, I had had a very high powered agent and we had tried to pub to take the book to traditional publishing Mm -hmm. and we had sort of failed. We had a lot of really interested people, but ultimately they were all a little afraid of the book. I don't really Mm -hmm. blame them. Like it was a little too adult to fit naturally in their YA categories. Mm -hmm. It was a little too violent. It was a little too much of a lot of things Mm -hmm. that didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. So Kickstarter felt when I started it, even though I was excited about it and I hoped it was going to work out, it's still, it was the backup plan. You know, it wasn't the way I had wanted to do it. So I don't know that there was, in my memory, it isn't like this exciting, proud moment because it was, it was, it was after I'd already lost, you know, but I will say that the experience of doing it, the response to the work, Mm -hmm. um, we got, um, not long after it come out, I'd say a couple months after it come out, we got this really incredible review of the book mm-hmm. uh, by a guy named Rob Bricken on IO9. And it, mm-hmm. it really launched it. Like tons of people found it because of that. And we, yeah. you know, I got a lot of sales. We mm-hmm. got movie interests, like all this stuff happened. Mm-hmm. That was definitely a moment though. Okay. Like more so than seeing my name on the cover. That was when I was like, Oh, this could really be a thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So. I, I'm just, I, it's just an observation, but I, and please don't get this, take this the wrong way, but in some sense, it's kind of good that, that whatever main, major publisher turned it down because you never gave up on your 
your story, your book. Yeah, I mean, I think, found another outlet to. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's I think there's two ways to look at it, and it sort of depends on the day to um, how I feel about it. I mean, I because my career has gone so well, mm-hmm. not not so much in novels, but in comics and in publishing in general Mm -hmm. I've been very lucky and fortunate and so it's easy to sort of have this approach but when I look back on the girl who would be king sometimes I feel like well I'm glad I stuck to my guns I'm glad I didn't turn it into what they wanted it to be yes um and it all worked out and it was for the best and that was the right decision Mm -hmm. sometimes I feel that way sometimes I feel like I've learned so much Mm -hmm. about being a writer and being published and working with editors and working with publishers since then mm-hmm. that if I, if I had done it again with some of that knowledge, would I have been more flexible about things? Would I have been able to find a compromise so that we got published by one of the big houses? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Would it have been a better book? Maybe. Would it have been a worse book? Maybe. I don't know, but it's a, uh, you know, path not taken, right? It's yeah. always, it's always tempting. Mm-hmm. So, but, you know, but, like I said, oh, um, I'm, I'm just going to ask, um, off the cuff question, you know, the girl who would be king, is it available anywhere? If, if listeners are interested in um, checking it out. Uh, it's, it's available on Amazon. It's also on Barnes and Noble, like digitally, or you can get like, they'll do a print on demand paperback, which is pretty oh, great. Yeah. Um, but they're not that cheap because they do them print on demand. The price is pretty high for a paperback. It's like, mm-hmm. $14 or something crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's available on Kindle and Nook and iPad and all that stuff out there. Uh, same for Story Killer. Story Killer, you can also still sometimes find the Kickstarter exclusive hardbacks here and there. Like I have, I have some for sale in my shop and stuff like that. But the Girl Who Would Be King ones are really hard to find. Like if you can find, sometimes I see them go up on eBay or Amazon for like 200 bucks. It's crazy. So it's, yeah. (laughs) Because it's a genuine limited capacity that will never be printed again. So it's like, I can't remember how many there are, but it's like, you know, 650 Mm -hmm. or something. It's, it's not a lot. So, Mm -hmm. um, I'm just asking when you go to your when you're at convention I'm sorry off the cut I'm sorry I'm, and I'm gonna start moving on after to Spider-Man but do, do you ever get like a, a fan that brings you the book to get an autograph well I don't I don't do conventions so no um I don't do conventions and signings um but I do sometimes have people not with any of the novels but with comics i have people send me stuff to my p.o box sometimes if because you can get signed stuff from my store but if they have a certain thing they want signed i let people send it to my p.o box like you know not if they want to send me like 50 comics but yeah 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 they can can send me a few things and if they send a you know self-addressed stamped envelope i'll send it back so you know i try i try my best to do a lot of podcasts and have that stuff available because i don't do signings so (laughs) It's a, it's a poor trade-off, but I, 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 I try. <laughs> no, but, 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 yeah, again, thank you for coming to, on to our podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on to the Amazing Spider-Man. Now, this is the part where, you know, we talked about, uh, well, I backed up on my reading and all this, you know, because life gets in the way. Now, I, I remember, now, for me, I remember Ben Riley from the, ninth, the late 80s series by Dan Jurgens. And again, you know, I'm backed up on my read. So may I ask, can you update our listeners on what's happening to Peter Parker? I know he's in some coma. Who And if you can let the listeners know who Ben Riley is and how did he come about to be Spider-Man? And... So um, the good news for readers who might be behind in their reading or who want to try something new or whatever um, is that you don't really have to have read the old stuff i mean mm-hmm. if you pick up um amazing spider-man 75 which is by zeb wells it'll pretty much give you everything you need and that's where that's the issue where peter something happens to peter uh, ben's already in the spidey costume he's sort of being fronted by a, a company called the beyond corporation mm-hmm. uh who's sort of made him the more public spider-man so there's some conflict there but um, Ben and Peter are very close. So, you know, it pretty quickly gets worked out into a more amenable situation. But I mean, in short, Ben Riley is a clone of Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. There were some very big clone, clone wars, clone, clone-tastic, I don't know, uh, mm-hmm. stories back in the day. 
um, you know, and Ben wasn't the only clone. There were, I mean, you don't have a story called Clone Wars without there being more than one. That's right. But, yeah. but I think he was probably the most notable, the biggest fan one. He became Scarlet, uh, Scarlet Spider for a while. Mm -hmm. um, he had a very crazy 90s costume. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, I'm not the most, I'm not the most well-read Spider-Man person either. I mean, I did my research that we needed to do for this, obviously. Um, but I think that this, other than Ben Riley being arguably the, the lead protagonist in our series, mm -hmm. um, there's not much related to like, clones in the story like i think we deliberately wanted to move away from this like we didn't want this to feel like oh this is another clone story it's like mm -hmm. yeah ben riley's a clone but that's about the only clone thing about this you know mm -hmm. so um yeah it's uh it's been great it's been really exciting um i'm excited about some of the characters we've brought in and some of the threads we're developing it's been really great yeah because i i'm going to say one of the characters that's very um interesting is max maxine danger is mm -hmm. that correct yes <laughs> can you tell can you tell us listeners a little bit more about her yeah so she's a little bit my baby she's the um director of superhuman or superhero uh department um like they have different departments among beyond and she's in charge of that mm -hmm. so she's sort of um ben's high up boss mm -hmm. and she's sort of one of those uh, bitches you'd sort of like to step on you in heels. She's mm -hmm. sort of she's sort of fantastic and bitchy and interesting, and there's a lot of morally questionable stuff. But I think that stuff makes her interesting. I mean, you have to be pretty morally questionable to work it beyond at the upper levels. I think, mm -hmm. um, but she's really interesting. I think whether she's a villain or a hero or an anti-hero or somewhere in between, there is still to be seen. Mm -hmm. uh remains to be seen but uh she's really fun sarah pacelli did sarah pacelli did an incredible design for her so that really pops so it's it's been fun to play with and then correct me if i'm wrong because maxine um her she appeared in amazing spider-man the recent volume of spider-man issue number 77 is that correct yeah my first issue is when she yeah. shows up yeah because okay. sarah designed her and i sort of created her so yeah yeah, because she looks awesome. At, at least I read She's those fun. Yes. I mean, listen, if you gotta if you gotta create a crazy character with that kind of who who, who you name Max Danger, then yes. you know you gotta give her a big design. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I love it. I love I love her. Man, I I was one of those reasons I oh, was like, who is this? You know, yeah. <laughs> She's really fun. She's really fun. I I think that's one of my big regrets. Is just you know, because the way the, the storytelling works, you know, I drop in for a couple issues and then I drop out toward the end. Yeah. It's been really fun to watch the other guys pick her up and run her story through, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause we all have to do that for each other is run those plot threads through. Yes. Um, but yeah, I've missed writing her cause she was, she was pretty fun. So. Um, now for the creative team, or I should say the beyond board, it's, it's you, it's Cody Ziegler, mm -hmm. Zeb Wells, Sal Sal Salad Saladin Ahmed, mm -hmm. Patrick Leeson. You guys are the new creative team. Um, let's see. Um, Nick Lowe is the amazing Spider-Man editor. Um, and I'm going to ask you the fun question. I've already, I'm going to ask when you guys meet up with Nick on Zoom. Because, and let me give <laughs> the listeners a little background. Um, if you listen to This Week in Marvel and Nick Lowe is on, sometimes he does a little singing. So does Nick does any singing in <laughs> your Zoom meetings? So I think I've mostly been spared the singing, but I have I have heard about the singing. Um, he's got, Nick has a ton of enthusiasm. He really loves what he does. You can really feel it um, in, in sort of everything he works on. And the, the singing does not surprise me at all. <laughs> And then, um, let me, and then, um, I'm going to, how did you get this cool assignment? I mostly luck or being in the right time, the right place. I don't know. I, uh, I think, um, Nick and I have a pretty good energy together. Zeb and I are friends. Um, I think probably also it didn't hurt. I mean, I wasn't there. I wasn't in these discussions, but 
it probably didn't hurt to have a woman involved. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they haven't had a lot of that with Spider-Man over the years. So um, it's fun. It's fun to get some female writers in the mix. Um, So, yeah, I I think I was actually in the middle of contract negotiations when when they were deciding whether I was going to get to do this or not. And so I sort of ended up being the last person who committed, but not because I didn't want to, but just because there were some technicalities going on about all that stuff. Okay. And then, um, um, let's see, how, how do you guys coordinate all this? I mean, amongst you guys, how do you, how do you guys co- coordinate the stories? And I, I know you did two issues. I think, um, I think before your two issues, 77 and 78, I think Zeb Wells wrote two issues. So how do you guys coordinate all this? So we do sort of zoom meetings since mm-hmm. the pandemic stuff. So you do sort of a writer's room, um sort of situation over in our case i think we did them in a day so we would mm-hmm. just have a really long day summit mm-hmm. um we maybe maybe our first one we might have done two days to get kicked off i can't remember but um so yeah you do that sort of makeshift writer's room over zoom you guys just i mean they you know they knew they when we came in or when it was pitched to me they were already in on the the Ben Riley idea um, Mm -hmm. and and bringing in beyond and all this stuff so the core concept was there Mm -hmm. and then it's just all the writers talking it out like what's the through line where do we want to get to where are the beats that we need to hit Mm -hmm. who are the characters we're going to bring in to help you know convey all this Um, and then Zeb is the leader so he Mm -hmm. sort of uh, gets to slash has to take all that information and like craft it into an outline and then we all sort of look at the outline and then we maybe come back to another meeting and flush it out and correct it where there are mistakes. And at some point, Nick um, gets involved in the, uh, he's involved all along, but at some point he begins to get involved in the casting it and trying to figure out who's going to write what, mm-hmm. who, we, who, what artists we can get for this. Mm. I mean, that's an incredibly delicate, I mean, that's like doing math. Like it's mm-hmm. incredibly difficult to figure out those schedules, especially where artists are concerned. And it's particularly complicated on a book that has three issues a month. Yes. So, um, so some of that, um, which issues we should write came from things that we were interested in or things that we thought we were particularly good at and would Mm -hmm. get sell at. So like, I'm very interested in all the beyond stuff because I'm a very big next wave fan and that's where that character comes from. So, or that's where that concept originated sort of, uh, or is least most famous for. Um, and so I was really interested in building a lot of that stuff. I was interested in creating Maxine. I was interested Mm -hmm. in sort of showing off the behind the scenes at beyond and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like that was part of why I ended up where I ended up 77 and 78. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, for like Saladin, particularly, you know, he's obviously very connected to miles stuff. So, you know, they slotted him in so that he could do more of the stuff that was going to involve miles. And so, yeah, it's a little bit what works and it's a little bit what we think people are going to really respond to and be excited about and be best at, you know? And then I'm going to, um, because I know you mentioned next wave because I've heard so many good things about that. I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic or anything. (laughs) Something I've always wanted to read because I believe it was a 12 issue 12 issues limited series, yeah. i think yeah yep i mean i think they wanted to do more i think it was very expensive to do and time consuming because mm-hmm. it has this incredible Stuart amonin art yes um and i so i think you know next wave is a book that wasn't super popular when it came out and then it sort of became a real cult hit after the mm-hmm. fact um so I think they probably would have liked to have done more than 12 issues for it, but I'll tell you what, I, they're almost perfect. So I'm sort of glad for what we got, you know, sometimes a limited story is good, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So listeners, you know, if you're interested for that, that next wave, um, it's available on Marvel, Marvel Unlimited or pick it up, you know, order it, um, order the trade from your um, local comic shop. Yeah, and they've got a they've got a really great trade that collects the full twelve too. If you don't want to get the two six or whatever they are, so yeah, it's great. Okay, um, let's see. Um, now, no spoilers. Are you guys working towards something big to celebrate Spider Man's sixtieth anniversary of his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy number fifteen um, next year, twenty twenty two? 
I think that's more a question for Zeb. I think my level of involvement is probably, I mean, I think it's pretty limited. Just even just not because not because I've been X'd out of anything or locked out of anything, but simply just because I've got a lot on my plate. And so mm-hmm. I think they they keep me a little sequestered in that respect. So but I wouldn't be surprised if Zeb and Nick and and other folks are are planning something cool there. I Marvel Marvel loves to to get an anniversary going so I I'd yes. be shocked <laughs> I'd be shocked if there wasn't something in the works all right um I'm gonna jump down to easter egg questions so the first one I want to ask you Dr. Kafka was that your idea <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> no she's been around for a while um I can't remember where she originated exactly yeah. but um but that's a that's a fun little bit and i was excited to get to make that joke about cockroaches <laughs> yes because and, and just for our listeners i mean because i remember i remember god i think it was in college when i read the short story by um franz kafka the metamorphosis where the guy was mm-hmm. turning into a cockroach i mm-hmm. so so that whole part because i read that so was that your part that you put in there about turning to half cockroach half spider was that yours? yeah wow. yeah yeah that was that was mine i just like that joke <laughs> that, was, that was great it was I'm, it's it's hard for me to resist a good joke sometimes uh sometimes you should like you know not do it but i i loved that one too much no but i loved it too <laughs> i did it was like oh my god you know <laughs> Now the next e- Easter egg. Now I read one in, um, one of your interviews um, on Marvel.com, and I saw it in issue number seventy-seven. There is one scene where some guy coming out of quote unquote the sandwich department. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a question. Now I can't remember the question exactly, but something about if we ever go to Mars, what type of food do you want in Mars or something? <laughs> what no that's not from the issue what's no not from the issue but oh from your okay. interview from your interview and i think you said sandwiches <laughs> oh yeah it is sandwiches are like my favorite thing for sure um when people ask me what's your favorite food i will probably say sandwiches <laughs> i don't know for sure that that's true but it feels true yeah. uh yeah so we just you know there was a lot of stuff you know part of what beyond mm-hmm. Um, especially if you've read Next Wave, you'll know this, but it also, I think um, Al Ewing did a great arc with them too. Mm -hmm. They're really, they're really crazy. Like they're into building products and, Mm -hmm. you know, pets and new science experiments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like they love to be like making the world better, Mm -hmm. but that's highly skeptical. Like, are you really, or are you making the world worse? Like that's a question mark. And so, you know, we wanted to play with a lot of fun things. Like I've got a fish in there who's walking on legs. We've got a little yes. robot floating in a bubble. Yes. And one of the things was I wanted a guy like looking horrified at what they'd done. And I was like, it should just be the sandwich department. Cause what on earth could you do to a sandwich? It'll just, people will love it. And so, yeah, it turned out really fun. Off the cuff question, favorite sandwich. Gosh, well, I have a very specific favorite sandwich, which is from a place in Santa Monica called Bay Cities. And it's basically like a an Italian sub kind of place. And they make their own bread. It's incredible. And mm. uh, it's just like the perfect sort of Italian blend of, oh, it's so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's probably my favorite sandwich. But like, you know, up here in Portland uh, during heirloom tomato season, I've had some of the best, um, like Lardo makes a BLT with heirloom tomatoes that's just to die for. Like, you know, there's a lot of good sandwiches out there, man. Oh, okay. It's hard to narrow it down. (laughs) (laughs) The final Easter egg, and this was in issue number 78. Um, Ben and his girlfriend, they're either, I think, I don't know if they're walking out of a movie theater, but I see Stegman comedy. (laughs) (laughs) Is that reference to someone in particular? <laughs> uh, it definitely is, but I did not write that joke. Um, uh-huh. I think that must have been Jim who did that, because oh. I think those were in his pages, right? Uh, um, I thought 78 was your issue. 
No, 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 it is. But I think oh. Jim had Jim had to help Sara out on art. She got behind on something else okay. she was doing. And so she needed a little help finishing the issue. Uh, I definitely did not write that on the marquee. So <laughs> it was e- that was either Nick Lowe or Jim, uh, or I would suspect Jim and Nick Lowe maybe. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure it's all intended in good fun. Everyone oh, loves yeah. Ryan. Everyone loves Ryan Stegman. He's impossible not to love. He's yeah. uh, he's really fun. Mm-hmm. Now, um, this last question, like, um, because correct me if I'm wrong, because I know from another interview that I read that you like to listen to music. You know, do you have, I'm sorry. I said, of course. Okay. Do you have a playlist when you're writing either like Black Widow or, you know, the couple issues for the Amazing Spider-Man? I do. My Spider-Man playlist is a little, it's a little it's a little janky, I have to say. It's a little more like just mm-hmm. new stuff. I didn't break it out the way I usually do. I think it's just because I was so, so busy. I usually do do um, individual playlists for like Captain Marvel, Black Widow, yes. Deadpool. Uh, I find music very helpful, not only to keeping me on task, which is a big problem that we all suffer from as writers, but also... Um, I use it as a little bit of a Pavlovian thing. Like if I hear certain songs or certain songs in a row, Mm -hmm. um, it can, it's just triggers me to think about, Oh, I should be writing that thing now. Like, Mm -hmm. because it just the repetitiveness of having done it that way. Um, But I did screw up a little bit on the Spider-Man because I was sort of just using a new playlist I'd created for some creator owned, but it was such a good playlist that I ended up using it a lot for Spider-Man because it had a lot of energy to it. Um, But yeah, it's very helpful for like, you know, especially, you know, like a a great example is when I was writing Deadpool and it's the pandemic and it's like, it was really depressed a lot of the time and did not feel like writing a lot of jokes. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, you're in the mood for that, but you really need to be writing Black Widow. So it, it can really be helpful to, to, to tune those playlists very specifically to like help shift your mood over to what you should be writing. So. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to move over the next set of questions. I'm going to focus on your sub stack. Now I'm, I'm being honest, listeners. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask this dumb question because I, I, I know Substack is a little bit new to me. So, and, and I know you mentioned in the beginning of the episode, but again, where can listeners, um, uh, where can listeners join your Substack? So if they go to 1979semifinalist.substack.com, you can oh, okay. subscribe. Um, you can subscribe for free. And so far, everything's been free. I haven't put anything behind a paywall yet. Uh Um, there are brand new, very cool comics starting up soon. Uh Um, and at least some of that will be behind a paywall. Uh Um, I also have, um, I've got this cool script post behind the scenes scripting post I'm doing this week where a ton of really great creators like Chip Zdarsky, Matthew Rosenberg, uh, Rainbow Rowell, Saladin Ahmed have given me fragments of a script because one of the questions I get asked the most of is how to format a script, how to make it look right, blah, blah, blah. And there aren't rules in comics the same way there are. Like if you write a screenplay, like screenplay has a very strict formatting rules. Um, I I would say comics have guidelines, Mm -hmm. Um, but everyone does it a little differently. Everyone sees someone else doing something and goes, Oh, that's cool. And borrows from it. So I thought, putting some cool examples from different writers who approach it differently might be helpful to people. So like, you know, there's, so there's also posts like that. Mm -hmm. Um, We're really trying to build a little community. Um, So uh, you can only comment right now if you're a paid subscriber. I think Mm -hmm. that's part of how we're going to maintain sort of the integrity. So it doesn't become like a, a Twitter nightmare situation yeah, over there yeah. <laughs> yes. um but but you can see all the posts for now um for free there's interviews with elena casagrande and lee jarbet and uh carmen carnero we talk about superhero costume design mm-hmm. uh i'm hopefully going to do an interview soon with adam hughes about covers wow. um there's all sorts of cool stuff there's behind the scenes stuff for the black cloak book that i'm working on that's going to yes. be the first comic that i put out <laughs> Um, with Meredith McLaren so Mm -hmm. we've put up some character designs and we talked about 
a first page and like the color on that first page and, and the evolution of where we thought we started, we were like, Oh, it's so great. And where we ended up was so different. And mm-hmm. we talk about all that sort of stuff. It's really fun. Now that's a great segue to black cloak. What is the story about? So black cloak is a, a sort of classic detective or PI story, mm-hmm. but set in a fantasy world. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like, all the creatures in the world got together to fight the great to defeat the great evil Mm -hmm. they vanquished it and now they gotta all get along in Mm -hmm. like the last city that's left standing Mm -hmm. and so they all basically live in this walled city of kiros not every single creature but most of the creatures left in the world live there Mm -hmm. and you know they don't all get along because you've got like dragon people and elves and humans and trolls and fairies and all sorts of crazy shit and uh so yeah they um it's this detective story about a murder that has taken place uh in sort of that's the opening pages we sort of see it taking place and it's the investigation into that and it's really you know it explores that world a lot like what it's like to be a black cloak the main character is a royal character who was exiled and now she's a black cloak so there's all this mystery surrounding her and everything it's uh it's really exciting i i can't wait for people to to check it out i it's such a strange thing to like be pouring so much of yourself into something and people haven't seen it yet you know it's a it's a weird it's a weird feeling so but i'm excited um let's see um, what movies or books inspired you to write this story, The Black Cloak? I think Black Cloak is probably inspired a little bit by every every detective story I've ever. They're my favorite stories, movies, TV, um, film, or uh, sorry, I said movies, uh, books, comics. I, I just love a good detective story. It's a it's a favorite genre of mine. Obviously, I wrote Jessica Jones and Hawkeye mm-hmm. as detectives. I, I'm a fan. Nancy Drew's a detective. Um, yeah, that's right. I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't make Sabrina the Teenage Witch a detective, but she was trying <laughs> to unravel mysteries, so she might as well have been. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so, but I think I, combining that with fantasy stuff, fantasy stuff doesn't always work for me. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of like putting it in a context where it doesn't necessarily fit or where you don't necessarily expect it i mean I'm, cert- I'm hardly the first person to do anything like that plenty of examples of that exist but um but yeah that's how i always like to see it is sort of in a weird context where it doesn't really fit you know mm-hmm. or it doesn't seem like it should fit and then your next um your next comic that's going to be coming out is now uh, correct i'm going to try to pronounce the title correctly the the call and then um what's this what's that story about so that is so so that's with maria de Ilias, who was my jessica jones collaborator he's currently working on valkyrie mm-hmm. uh he's really an incredible talent with a totally different style from meredith which i think is really fun like he's got a very highly realistic yes you know photorealistic style whereas meredith has you know, sort of flat colors and a much more cartoony look. So I sort of love that those are two of the first projects that I'm doing that they're so different. But um, so the call is, I would say it takes most of its inspiration from like a more grown up Goonies. Mm -hmm. Um, So these are, so it's sort of like a sci-fi fantasy adventure story, but with kids who have just graduated from high school who are sort of having their last summer together before they go their separate ways Mm -hmm. and uh, something goes horribly wrong. (laughs) (laughs) As you can maybe tell from the teaser art. (laughs) Oh my. And if, um, for our listeners, you know, check out the, you know, it's the teaser art. I mean, sure you can find some anywhere, but I know I saw I saw the preview art pages on CBR, and it's awesome. It really is, and yeah, I love that. There is that. What was it? There's a page where you could see like some type of outline of a creature in a mm-hmm. fog. Yeah, that's God, the, man, I'm. Yeah, it, yeah, that's it, the that's the call. That's the call, uh, and that was you know, when I knew Maddie was going to do it with me, that was one of the first things that came into my head was that image, that beach and that sort of reaction shot of those mm-hmm. characters. 
um yeah it was very cool um i you know i'm very lucky that someone of his caliber is you know willing to take a chance on me and 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 do this together you know i um i know it doesn't seem like it should be a risk because i'm a pretty well established creative at this point but you know it's always hard to to go create your own like you don't know how it's going to work out like you hope it'll be <laughs> work out but you don't know for sure and so um it was exciting it was exciting to have him have the faith in me to like take that leap. It was really great. Um, I think you guys are going to love what we're pulling together. I'm just trying to be worthy of it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that previews page, it was like, Oh my God. It's just, when you see the outline of the call, it, it just gave me chicken skin or, or goosebumps. I should say chicken yeah. skin is the chicken skin is the local phrase of goosebumps. No, I've definitely heard that. Oh, okay. We heard that. It's made its way to the mainland then. <laughs> <laughs> but it, um, it, it, yeah, it, no, it's, uh, he's incredible. He's incredible. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I can't wait for people to check it out. I just mm -hmm. hope I can be worthy of him and the readers, but I, I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many, now for each comic book, you know, on your sub stack, how many pages are going to be released each week? So it's not going to be exact because, you know, it's like when you're writing a monthly comic, you're trying really hard to have a cliffhanger of some sort at the end of each issue to make sure people come back for the next issue. And then you hope that all of that reads well together as an arc for the trade. It's a lot of things to think about. But then now that we're breaking it up into even smaller pieces, it sort of adds to the trickery. So uh, it's not always going to be exactly five pages. For example, the first issue is quote unquote issue is 22 pages. So the first section people will get is seven mm -hmm. pages and then they'll get three more five page drops. Mm -hmm. uh, the second quote unquote issue I wrote, I think came in at 25 pages mm -hmm. and it's not five pages <laughs> each because you just want to pick, you know, you just want to pick the better break point. Like mm -hmm. yes. what's a large enough section that I feel readers really got some meat mm -hmm. and, or we, we had an intriguing thing that's going to, you know, excite them for what's next. So it's a little bit, um, a little bit science, a little bit magic there. Um, and I'm new to this too. So, you know, I'm trying my best. I, so far it's actually working quite well. I was very nervous about it initially that mm -hmm. the pages either weren't going to feel substantial enough or, um, they were going to feel too jerky when you put it together, right? Because you're trying to create too many, oh my God moments within yes. so many pages each time. But so far it's going really well. And it's breaking quite naturally um, without me changing my style too much, which mm -hmm. tells me that it's probably how the, the, it's probably how the ingredients of a regular 20 page comic, if, if I sit down and go back and look, I bet you can find that those break pretty well into little sections because you have to keep moving. You know, it's like a comic book issue is like spinning plates, right? Mm -hmm. You're spinning, spinning, spinning these, but then you need to bring these other ones in in order to get to the place you need to go. And so I think this is just a slightly more complicated version of that. Mm -hmm. I was also reminded, um, I don't know if you ever read these, but many years ago when I was not reading a lot of comics, I discovered the Warren Ellis, um, God, what was it called? Oh, what was the name of that? He did a, was it global frequencies? No, okay. but yeah. no, but you, oh, man, what was it called? My God, I just looked it up the other day. I'm losing my mind. Anyway, Warren Ellis did a comic online mm -hmm. oh, okay. that they did it in six page installments. And I don't know why they chose that, but I went back and looked at that again. And yeah, it's a little bit like the Substack model to me. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's, it, it seemed foreign to me when I started, but I think actually when you start to examine it, it works pretty naturally. Wow. Okay. Um, um... Uh, it was called Freak Angels. Sorry. Oh, okay. No, I've, I'm going to say I've never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you planning to print the call and the black cloak sometime in the future? 
Yes, I have partnered with Image for that, and I'm very excited about it. Nice. Uh, you know, I've never gotten to do anything with them before, mm -hmm. um, so it's I'm I'm very excited. Um, uh, I don't know what the schedule is going to be for those yet, yeah. and I don't quite know how it's even going to look. Like for example, um, for Black Cloak, we all felt like the cliffhanger at the end of 22, mm -hmm. while it while it worked for a weekly cliffhanger, we mm -hmm. didn't feel it was great for a end of an issue cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to actually combine the first two issues for an oversized issue one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a lot of decisions like that we're making. So I don't know what the schedule is going to be yet. And of course, the things going on in the world have made things worse. Paper shortage, shipping delays, supply chain, mm -hmm. labor chain. It's, you know, it's tough. But eventually, yes, they will be printed comics that people can grab, mm -hmm. both floppies and trades. Um, what do you like about Substack and print? Um, I think the great thing about Substack so far is that, A, they've given us money to create our own stuff and own our own stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which is huge. Um, but... I, the thing that surprised me most about it and that I'm into more than I thought I would be is this feeling of creating a community, mm -hmm. this feeling of creating, you know, not just, oh, hey, here's people who like my work, but here's like-minded people who might also like each other and that we can all talk about this stuff with. Um, I also think that, you know, something Nick Spencer's really excited about, and I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I definitely think he's right, is that it's, it's an incredible time to be a fan or especially a fan who wants to be a creator because there's just so many resources out there of yes. people showing process, showing behind the scenes stuff, mm -hmm. giving access in interviews to pages, to scripts, to art, you know, so you can see how all of this is built. I mean, back when I discovered those uncanny X-Men comics and fell in love with comics and started writing them, like, I didn't have any guidelines. Like there was no, there was no online to show me what a script should look like or how to do it. I was just writing it in my, you know, college ruled notebook. Like, you know, put, if someone putting someone's name in the margin and then their dialogue after it, like mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. And so I think that that kind of stuff is really cool. And I'm certainly not the only one doing it. A lot of people are doing those kind of posts. I mean, Scott Snyder is running a whole school yeah. out of his. So mm -hmm. it's just a lot of really cool stuff that, I mean, I think, because I'm very invested in the comics, I think the comics are the big seller, mm -hmm. but, but I always thought that. And now I think, oh, there's a lot of other stuff that's interesting too about this. So mm -hmm. that's been cool. Um, I think print versus digital. I mean, we're, we're collectors. Yeah. The, the desire for print is never going to go away. There's mm -hmm. something tangible about it that is, very different and almost has become even more precious, I think, to us in a largely digital age. Mm -hmm. There's something wonderful about knowing that someone can't delete that file and now you don't have it anymore. Like I think for, I think for comic collectors, we're a little nerdy and neurotic. And I think that doesn't sit that well with us, this idea of not really owning it or not really having it fully. But I also think that digital is a game changer in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Most, a lot of people don't have access to a shop or a good shop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, digital comics, while not cheaper initially, mm -hmm. there are some that are cheaper. And if you're willing to wait a little bit, it can, the price can become better. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which digital comics are more inclusive not to mention all the really great free stuff that's out there on, on online yeah. webtoons mm -hmm. and stuff. So I, I think, you know, to me, it's always been a hybrid. It's not one or the other. I yeah. love shops. I don't want that stuff to go away, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's anything wrong with exploring both, you know? Yes. And the thing is, I agree with you on, you know, like um, for digital comics, like you said that, you know, um, and I remember in one of your interviews that, you know, not a lot of people have access to comic shops or, or let's say even a grocery store that yeah. Even if the grocery store has comics, their own, and, and it's nothing against Marvel or DC, but that's all they're going to carry is DC or Marvel. And it's always going to be a limited, whatever, yeah. stuff, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Um, but someone who lives on Lanai, you know, 
can have that has internet access can get digital comics the same as someone in the middle of the yeah Utah. yeah yeah exactly yeah. yeah i totally agree i totally agree yeah okay so uh, i'm going to slowly start wrapping this up um are you going to have any more comics to line up for your sub stack no spoilers I, but i'm just asking <laughs> i am i can't talk about it yet yeah. really it's still being developed but I, yes, there will be an announcement probably in January or February about some other stuff, uh, at least one other book that's being developed. So it's oh. very exciting. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to start wrapping this up. Um, final questions. Actually, one off the cuff question. You said that you, 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 you had your own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I had, um, well, it wasn't mine alone, but um, I had a um, three chicks review comics. It was hosted on cbr comics should be good um i hosted it with uh i started it with my friend sue and my friend maddie um eventually maddie had to drop out and we became two chicks but we just didn't change the name mm -hmm. um and yeah we would just review comics and talk about sort of hot button stuff that was being talked about in comics and then at some point we started doing a lot of interviews which was both really fun and I really enjoyed it. And it was also a really ended up being a good networking thing for me because I got to meet and talk to a lot of people who, you know, I think that's probably the first way I ever talked to Kelly Sue DeConnick. And then, you know, you can't draw a straight line to eventually two or whatever years later, I co-wrote a book with her at Marvel, but I don't think it's, you know, it's also not, not a line you know what i mean like there's these are the way that you make connections with people and that mm -hmm. eventually pay off years down the line you know that's right and now correct me if i'm wrong because it was was it oh 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 i'm going blank captain marvel and the uh, yeah Carol Carol Corps. Corps. yeah yes. okay yeah that was my yeah that was my first marvel job and it was with kelly sue DeConnick and I still don't know to this day how it came about, like if she recommended me or if they were just looking for people and they suggested me to her and she said, okay, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it, a lot of people that I started talking to, I still talk to today. I mean, we yeah. interviewed Scott Snyder, we interviewed Greg Rucka, we interviewed, you know, like all these people mm -hmm. that are now sort of my colleagues and mm -hmm. it's uh, fantastic, so. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm slowly wrapping things up. How are Clive and the Monarch, your cat? How are, right? <laughs> that, those are the name of your cats, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, they're good, they're good. Monarch threw up yesterday. I don't know what else, what's up with that, but otherwise they're good. He goes, <laughs> again, on marvel.com, dated September 17th of this year, because during your, that interview, you post, they posted an Instagram of Clive and the Monarch, kind of like, Hugging each other. That, that was just so cute. They did? On yeah, Marvel.com? Yes. I don't remember this or maybe didn't know about it. That's funny. <laughs> because I was like, and I was like, what is, and, 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 it, and it had your, you know, the, the 1979 semifinalists. And I was like, oh. That's so funny. I wish I knew what that was. That's funny. Um, let's see. And um, how awesome is it to live near Powell's bookstore? Uh, Powell's is great. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's about five of the years we've been here, about two and a half of them now have been pandemic. So, you know, don't go there as much as we thought. But um, yeah, it's an incredible shop. It's, uh, it's the best. It's got, man, I can't, I can't even go in there without walking out for so much damage. And they also have, um, in addition to having such an incredible selection of books, which is what you're usually there for, They've got a lot of really cool, sometimes local Portland specific, like just fun stuff to buy, which I'm sort of a sucker for. Like I bought, I remember I bought these ice packs that were like of little woodland creatures. They were like the greatest things I ever bought. Like, and I just, they were like just hanging there at checkout. We got these amazing Portland glasses mm -hmm. there. Like mm -hmm. they, they have all sorts of cool stuff. That's even if you're not into books, but obviously the books are the highlights. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry listeners sorry i forgot so paula's bookstore is in port is in oh shoot god i forgot yeah I, yeah, I, yeah. I portland right? portland oregon yep it's this huge it's a it's a it's about a it's a it's a size of a block i don't what three yeah. or four stories there's like a basement 
they sell new and used books literally side by side. It's incredible. Yeah, you know? it's an incredible location. It's an incredible shop. Yeah. And they actually have some other locations. Yeah. I think maybe they've got a pop-up location in Portland, and then they've also got something that's outside of Portland that's like not downtown. So, um, yeah, incredible yeah. shop. Incredible shop. I it's the number one thing you know, you recommend to people when they come to Portland, I'd say, um, you yeah. know, other, other than physical <laughs> things like, you know, Multnomah Falls or something, obviously. Oh, yeah. but We've been there. Me and my wife have been to the falls. It's very beautiful, cool. right? Yes, yeah. It yeah. It's gorgeous. Okay. Sorry, I mean, so- I mean, you're in, you're in Hawaii, so <laughs> I, I don't know if you were that impressed. <laughs> no, I was because it's, it's different. You know, it's, these are pretty cool things to see, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, favorite convention moment as a fan? Because I, I know you say you don't do conventions, but I, I know you went to one. Did you go to <laughs> another convention? I That's the only one I went to. I mean, I went to the LA used to have like sort of a a shady, weird thing that was like people bringing a bunch of boxes to a bunch of comic book boxes to a basement somewhere. I guess I went to one <laughs> of those. But uh, no, I, I think... Um, if we don't want to pick my Chris Claremont being mean to me story. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, 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 that experience at San Diego Comic-Con when I was a teen was incredible. Yeah. I will say one thing I got there among many things I got there was a huge homage studios poster. Oh I mean, God. like, I mean, yeah. I mean, huge. It was like, at one point I put it up in my college apartment bedroom Mm -hmm. and it was, I mean, I would say it was like two to two and a half feet by at least six feet. It was Mm -hmm. crazy. And it had all these homage studios characters on it. It was so cool. I I've never seen it like on eBay or Mm -hmm. anything. I wish I know what happened to mine because I took really good care of it for a long time, but Mm -hmm. it was like, it definitely feels like one of those crazy things that you could sell for a lot of money on eBay if you still had it. <laughs> yeah. Especially nowadays, you know? Yeah, because I just think, you know, it's hard to keep a poster in good shape for so yes. long, first of all. But um, yeah, it was one of those really unique things. I They were probably just giving them out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it was really cool. I miss that poster. <laughs> all right, last. Um, I'm slowly wrapping this up. Um, we've already talked about this, so now correct me if I'm wrong. You've been to Hawaii before, correct? With you, you and your family. I have, I have. We, twice we've stayed in Maui. Uh, my parents have been other times. They love Hawaii and they have more disposable income than I do, so they go more than I do. But um, it's incredible. It's I, I'm not that well traveled, so I don't know that this is the compliment it deserves to be. But it was by far one of the most beautiful and magical places I've ever been. No, I'm going to say. Maui is perfect. Kauai is perfect. Um, Oahu is more, we, we, you know, because it's, it's, you know, it's the, it's the, you know, we have the state capital here. So it's, it, yeah, it's going to pretty much sort of, yeah, at times it's going to look like, yeah, it looks like any city in the United States. Well, except for, you know, I doubt skies, that. You know? Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. skies, the beach, the mountains. I mean, yeah, but, but, you so know, bad. but, but Maui is, you know, you see all their greenery, you know, um, you know, it's, yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, we go to Maui because my parents found a rental house there that they really fell in love with. And so we always go back to that same rental house. But I have to say, I have always wanted to check out other islands. Um, so maybe, maybe we're supposed to go back this summer. And if that happens, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get a chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, do you have any last words to our listeners? I think we got it. Um be be kind, wear your mask, wash your hands. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, Kelly, I wanna, you know, I wanna wish you all the success to your amazing Spider-Man run and you know to your Substack, you know. Um, you know, I, that it sounds great, you know. So you'll probably see my name pop up there one day as one of your uh, subscribers. <laughs> I'd love that. I'd love that. Uh, and Kelly Mahalo, you know, thank you for, thank you in Hawaii. Thank you very much for your time. And I know I told you in the email, it's only an hour. We're going to keep this in an hour. It's like, oh my God, I'm looking at the time. It's, it's <laughs> like an hour and a half. So thank you very much for your time. 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me on. I had a great time. Well, thank you. And then um, I want to thank Drew, the co-host for Comics for Fun and Profit, for putting this episode together. You know, Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. And if you are a new listener to the show, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit that comes out every Saturday. And lastly, I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha. <laughs>